welcome back to another episode of The Soapbox. Uh, to finish off knee month, I thought we would do another injury feature, uh, much like we had the ankle sprains explained at the end of last month. Um, today's featured injury is PFPS, or patella femoral syndrome. And the images I'll be showing is, um, I've kind of gathered them from the Trail Guide to the Body, 5th edition, uh, by Andrew Beal. It's a great resource if you do like the images. So, without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so first off, um, let's define it. So, patella femoral syndrome. Um, it sounds worse than it actually is. Like, I have a syndrome. And honestly, it's not that bad. It's one of the most common things that I see in clinic. And basically, if we keep it super simple, it's a knee tracking issue. And we'll kind of go through the anatomy. But basically, you have your patella here that sits right over the knee joint. And if you're having kind of achy knees or pain in and around the kneecap, um, and you've heard that you've been diagnosed with patella femoral syndrome, it really just kind of means that the cartilage sitting under the kneecap um, is getting irritated, most likely because this isn't tracking nicely in the joint. So it's kind of off kilter a bit. That's essentially what it is in a nutshell. So um, it can resolve. Um, it, you don't have to have it for life, um, but it's basically just a tracking issue. You might also hear it referred to as chondromalacia patella or patellae. Um, it's kind of another name that's thrown around. Again, it's, it's a knee tracking issue. The knee just isn't happy because it's not sitting nicely in the joint for whatever reason. So starting off with a bit of anatomy, I thought we'd start from the bottom up. So we're looking at the shin bone here. We have the tibia bone, which is the kind of the most medial and the thickest shin bone. Um, so it's this one here that I'm highlighting. This is your tibia. And then we have the fibula, which is kind of tucked right beside. Um, it doesn't actually make up the knee joint, but just know that there are two shin bones, okay? And we will primarily be talking about the tibia. If we work our way up, we have the thigh bone, and the technical term for the thigh bone is the femur bone, okay? So that's one of the biggest bones in the body, and that's going to connect up into the hip. Uh, this is just an image of what that femur actually looks like. So we have the top round part here. This is part of a ball and socket joint. It's going to stick in the hip joint, um, and that part is called the head. We have the greater trochanter, which you can kind of feel it's a bony uh, little protuberance that um, sticks out from the side of our thigh. And we follow that all the way down and we're going to basically focus on this part of the femur um, because that essentially makes up the superior aspect or the um, top portion of the knee joint. So the patella, not your Nutella as I tell my kids, but the patella. So um, it's, it's not super flat on the underside, okay? It has like these two little grooves and that's where cartilage sits. And that's what can get kind of irritated, again, if it's not tracking properly over the knee joint, okay? Um, but it kind of sits right over it in this little groove and it's like what this is represented by on this model, this is actually the quads. And again, we're gonna touch on a little bit of musculature in and around the knee joint, just so you get an idea of the anatomy. And if we put it all together, there's essentially the femur making up the top part, the patella that sits over top, and the tibia, the shin bone. We won't go into detail about this today, but just know there are other ligaments and structures that connect these bones together. Um, but again, for the sake of today, just keeping it super simple with the bony anatomy as well as the muscles. So we're gonna start with the quads. Quad meaning four, so there are in fact four thigh muscles. Okay, so we have these three, if you look to the left-hand side, we have rectus femoris, which is the only one that actually crosses the hip, okay? So that's going to contribute to its special action. So rec fem sits on top, then we have on the outside what's called 
vastus lateralis, so we're looking at our right leg here, and then we have one that sits on the inside called vastus medialis, okay? Medial means closest to the midline. Now, if we took those all away and we go to the right-hand side of the picture, what sits underneath is one that sits right in the middle, intermediate, if you will, vastus intermedius, all right? So those four make up the quads. Now, notice they all kind of come together. They get married at the bottom, right where the knee is, and they come together. This is called the patellar tendon, and that, in fact, is that patella crosses the knee joint, and then it we technically call it the patellar ligament. Okay. And if you remember a little lecture based on, you know, the difference between tendons and ligaments, tendons tend to connect muscle to bone. So again, the quads would be coming down here over the femur. This is our patellar tendon, crosses the patella, and then we would refer to it technically as the patellar ligament. Okay, and then it's going to attach to that tibia bone. All right. So if we turn the knee around, um, on the back of the thigh, that is where the hamstring group sits. And notice there's technically three hamstrings, okay? So there's two separate ones on the inside or the medial aspect, our semimembranosus and semitendinosus. And then on the outside, um, it looks like two, but it's actually one muscle with two heads, and that's called our biceps femoris, okay? So just know the hamstring group is kind of making up the back of the knee. Um, that's the group on the back of the thigh bone. And then touch on these briefly. These are our inner thighs. There's quite a few of them, okay? So they're called our adductors because what adduction means is bringing the leg closer to midline, and that's the primary job of this muscle group. And again, just notice that a few of them do cross the knee joint there on the inside. Okay, most important highlight star. This is the most important muscle or piece of fascia that I want you to remember, okay? Because this has a huge impact on why PFPS or patellofemoral um, pain syndrome starts. So basically, we have two things that we're looking at here. I want you to focus on the little red portion on the anterior part of the hip called our TFL or our tensor fascia lata, okay? This is the only muscular part of this IT band. So the IT band isn't actually muscle, okay? So fascia is essentially like the sausage casing of the body. And the IT band is like a really thick, um, thick inversion of that, okay? Think of it like a really thick piece of saran wrap. And it's represented usually in photos by like this really thick kind of white tissue. So the IT band goes from the top of the hip, the hip crest, all the way down, and it actually goes past the knee and intertwines with that fibula, that outside shin bone. It's pretty long, so when we are rolling it or when we're releasing it, don't just get that middle piece. You actually want to get like the whole thing, um, and just know that technically the front piece right up at the top is the only muscular part, and that's its little buddy TFL, okay? So let's think about this. We have a really kind of maybe tightened band. Again, reasons can vary as to why it's tight on certain people. Um, but we have this really tight band all on the lateral side of the leg. If it starts to get tight, what it's going to do is just start to pull that kneecap off kilter. Okay, so then as you can see, it's not sitting nicely in the groove. So I find this is usually one of the top things you should just start releasing or checking in with if you're starting to get some knee achiness. Okay, honestly, nine times out of ten people, that IT band is tight. Now, we can't just release it and be done with it, okay? So that's where the strengthening piece comes in, which I'll kind of touch on here in a second. So this is one of the ones I walk you through how to release in one of the other Soapbox episodes called Self-Treatment for the Knee. So good one to uh, remember and check out. And then this is just a brief overview. Um, so again, we have the quads in the front. They're coming down and crossing the patella here at the bottom. Um, the two that I do want to kind of highlight here is psoas major um, and iliacus. 
And I'll get into this more with hip month, but notice psoas actually starts at the lumbar spine, and it's a thick guy, and that's going to cross the front of the hip along with iliacus, so this is technically our hip flexor. This, along with the quads in the front, can be prone to getting quite tight and then causing some of that again, knee achiness or PFPS. So I do like to kind of work on both of these, but the ones you can do at home is essentially the quads. There's different things for the, the psoas. Um, that is a little bit safer, so I don't usually teach people, like, don't try to put a tennis ball in there or anything. Um, it's a hard one to release on your own, so I do have special techniques for that one. And then if we look at the back, we have that glute, um, and then the hamstring group if we look at the bulk of the back of that thigh, okay? Okay, moving down. So, just want to speak about a few other actions of the knee. So, what can the knee do? It can flex, also known as bending, and it can straighten, also known as extending. So, let's think about this. The quads that were on the front, they're going to primarily help extend the knee. So every time the quads contract, they're gonna pull up a little bit on that patella. On the back of the leg, we have those hamstrings. They're gonna to attach to the back of the knee and they're gonna help with knee flexion, okay? Now, as much as it can bend and straighten, what I find, you know, even people kind of forget about is there is a bit of this tibial rotation or shin bone rotation, okay, we might call it tibial torsion in the clinic, um, and that can happen, again, for a few reasons. The number one thing that I will see is people will duck walk, okay, so they're walking with their feet kind of turned out versus parallel, so think if you're walking with your foot kind of turned out, isn't that going to affect that knee tracking and again kind of torque that knee joint and now you're bending extending on a slightly torsion shin bone so i say one of the easiest things you can fix is try to watch how you're walking we also call that gait okay so try to walk toes forward um, especially to the kids it's an easy habit to kind of nip in the butt um, right off the get-go so um, no duck walking because that is going to add to that tibial torsion now i have shown the muscles because if you think about okay if i am walking like a duck what might be getting tight as a result so as much as we have the it band coming down here we actually have muscles on the side that i will check in with as well if anyone's having any knee pain and those are called your peroneal muscles so i'm looking at peroneus longus and brevis and ultimately they're kind of a brotherly combo and they sit on the outside of the shin so usually i'll check in with those because it's kind of a continuum um, of fascia again we call it the lateral line where we have the it band coming down and then the peroneals on the side so i always like to work my way down into those as well then just off the front of those is one I wanted to highlight called your tib ant or your tibialis anterior. So this is the meaty guy that you can feel just off to the outside of that shin bone. That's also when I find if I have a duck walker in front of me, that'll often be tight and again kind of be a culprit to pull off that kneecap off kilter. So um, those ones, let's not forget about the shin portion of muscles that can also become tight with any knee tracking or knee pain issues. So here I've just isolated them for you. If we take all those muscles away, this is your peroneal group, okay? It's actually gonna help with lifting the outside border of the foot. These will also get tight if you're walking turned out. So basic overview of the muscles. We have our quads. They sit on the front of the leg. They're going to extend the knee. Hamstrings sit on the back. They're going to flex. In other words, bend our knee. Then we have our adductors or inner thighs, and they're going to help adduct the thigh bone or bring those legs in towards midline. And they also help with rotation, internal rotation at the hip. The lateral fascial line, IT band and peroneal. 
So again, IT band is that really thickened band of fascia. And then all throughout all of the muscles, all of the body, we have that sausage casing, that continuum of fascia. And so if we just kind of work our way down, continue with where that kind of the side of the leg is, that's why I work those peroneals and try to release those as well. Because if the IT band's tight, nine times out of 10, so are those peroneals if I keep working down. And then I have like, you can also have some tibialis anterior, that meaty kind of like, off to the side of the shin bone in the front kind of tightness, especially if they're a duck walker. Um, and it, again, it'll affect the pull or the tracking of that patella. So main muscles to release. So if you're starting to get knee pain, definitely check out my self-treatment ideas for the knee. I give kind of my go-tos of how to release the IT band, be it rolling, cupping, okay, and also um, some other neat ideas going into strengthening, because we can't just release everything and walk away and we're all good. Um, why do those muscles tighten in the first place? And usually it's because of a weakness at the hip, okay? So that's the other piece um, people forget about, is you can't just release the muscles, you have to ask, well, why do they tighten up in the first place? Right? So that's why we check, are we walking like a duck? And how is our knee tracking when we go to bend our knees? If you think of something as simple as a squat, if I go to bend my knees and my knees collapse in or they go to kind of kiss each other, um, that's a sign of hip weakness and we actually have to retrain it so our knees face forward all the time as soon as we go to bend our knee. So the main muscles to strengthen, I've highlighted glute medius the hamstrings, and also I try to encourage tibial internal rotation. So if I know my person is a duck walker, I'll actually have them sit in a chair and toe in. And usually they're restricted with that, okay? Um, and again, if you want a little reference of some exercises to get started on, not only do the release work, but also start on, I have one called basic and bilateral. So it's retraining squats and bridges on two feet. That is my number one go-to for just starting nice and gentle if somebody has some really angry knees. Um, and then progressions in parallel is basically going from a squat and then how can we progress on one leg? And again, that is all strengthening at the hip joint to help the knee. So just keep in mind, one knee injury does not match all. So just because I see one person with patellofemoral syndrome and then in walks in another one does not mean I'm going to treat those two people the same. It all depends on multiple factors, such as how irritable is that knee joint? And I kind of grade them like low irritability, moderate or high. The knee joint, not the person. <laughs> so. Basically, I would have them do a few basic tests, and if already it's really starting to ramp up and they're complaining of increased pain after a few reps, I'd say that's pretty highly irritable. So I'm gonna make sure that those modifications that person does are pretty high and that they comply with those. Um, so I just kind of take note, how ticked off are these person's knees? Cause that can vary person to person. History of previous injury. Have they injured those knees before? It does have an impact on how well are they gonna understand what's going on with their knees. Were they compliant? Um, is this the same issue they had before and they maybe dropped off on their strengthening? So all these are gonna, kind of giving me an indication of, okay, what type of, of um, compliance do I have and what type of person is sitting in front of me? How well are they dealing with the injury? So especially with kids, because I do see a lot of young kids, um, sometimes this is their first injury ever, and that can be super scary and traumatizing. They've never had pain before, and they immediately associate pain with danger. Um, that's usually what the body is trying to do, is protect the body. And I might, I'm going to try to do a um, lecture on just pain. And just know that pain does not correlate with the amount of tissue damage. So if somebody came to me and they had extreme, like 10 out of 10 pain, um, 
I wouldn't necessarily think, oh, that person's got a lot more damage in their knee than the next person. Not what I think at all, because it's not true. That is a myth, all right? So pain comes in multiple forms, and it depends where you are on your injury path. If the knees are just starting to get sore, and it's fairly early in the game, I'm talking under three months, um, I'm going to deal with that person differently than I would if, oh, Danny, I've had this knee issue for like five years. Then we actually need to do some brain retraining um, to help decrease the pain. So pain does not correlate with tissue damage. Compliance with the program. So I can only do so much. I think of myself as like a coach. You would never go to a personal trainer and be like, hey, can you, uh, can you strengthen my biceps for me? No, it just doesn't work like that. So I will give you the tools. I can help coach. That's also why the soapbox is there, because half of this stuff I'm saying on repeat in clinic anyway, so you may as well get a jump start on it. Um, but you have to do your part too. And so if that person isn't doing their stuff, I will not be able to help them. doesn't matter how many magic tricks I have in my back pocket, they have to help themselves. Gait, right? So walking. Number one thing, watch how you're walking and watch other people's walking, especially the duck walking, the like turned out feet, super common. It mucks up your toe, your ankle, your knee, even your hip. So um, it's an easy fix and something you can watch for right away. Respect the modification. So usually with any knee pain, likely we're not doing any high impact if they first came in for an assessment. So that'll be the first thing I say is we're not going to be running or jumping anytime soon. Pretty high impact for the hip and the knee, so we're going to hold off on those. So really respect the modifications and kind of um, rely on your therapist to kind of guide you back into those um, activity things uh, per, with a progression. Taping and bracing, okay? Also a good resource, but I say never use those in isolation. So, okay, you put a brace on, we're not going to have that on our knee our whole life. Same with tape. The taping is just a little proprioceptive input. Some people like the feel of it. It actually feels like it's supporting the knee. Great. That allows some maybe pain-free or more comfortable positioning for them to do their strengthening. So it's never meant to be used in isolation, but I do have my kind of top taping techniques up on the soapbox. Um, for patellofemoral, I also have one for patellar tendonitis, um, and I'll, I'll try either one. Doesn't matter if they technically have PFPS or patellar tendonitis. Some people like the feel of one more than the other, so definitely check those out. Um, but start with the lateral release of the knee, you can try some taping for day-to-day -day activity, and also make sure you're being coached by a trained health professional on strengthening so you can return to sport safely. So that's all I have for today. If you have any questions, please feel free to message me. That's my kind of quick and dirty on patellofemoral pain syndrome. Um, yeah, it just sounds worse than it is. It's a knee tracking issue. It is very common. Um, so that's why I'm highlighting it this month. So get a start on those releasing those lateral fascial lines. Thanks so much, guys, and we'll see you next week.